human action appeared on September 14th in 1949 and uh, some people like Murray Rothbard were lucky they got their hands on the book as soon as it came out um, let me just uh, briefly quote Rothbard regarding this event he said to me who had the privilege of reading the book on publication it was an achievement that changed the course of my life and ideas for here was a system of economic thought that some of us had dreamed of and never thought could be attained uh, and economic science whole and rational and economics that should have been but never was now I personally was not as uh, lucky as Murray uh, I was born just 12 days before human action appeared <laughs> so I could have read it of course but my English at that time was rather uh, <laughs> and, uh, and in addition the German predecessor of the book had long been out of print uh, so unfortunately uh, it would take somewhat longer until I would encounter human action and then go through an experience that was somewhat similar to that that uh, Rothbard described. Um, in fact, it would take me another 25 years or so. Um, I had uh, just finished my, my PhD in philosophy and uh, had been awarded a, a travel grant to spend a few months in the United States at the University of Michigan and um, it was in the library of the University of Michigan in 1974 uh, where I first discovered human action. Now, of course I had been familiar with Mises' name before. Um, during my last two years at, uh, at the gymnasium and for my first two years at the Goethe University in, in Frankfurt, I had become very much interested in leftist, as a matter of fact, in, in Marxist social theory. Uh, remember that this was the time of the student rebellion in the late 1960s in the United States as well as in, uh, in Europe. And Mises was, of course, a name that was familiar in leftist circles, um, but of course only to be dismissed um, as some bourgeois reactionary and an enemy of the forces of social progress uh, could not be taken seriously and definitely should not be arrested. Um, nonetheless, while his name was mentioned by lefties at the time, if only to be dismissed, um, I do not recall that Mises was ever mentioned by any of my more moderate or mainstream teachers. In fact, when I prepared for this lecture, I looked up the books that were used for the two regular economics classes, introductory and intermediate economics, which I took during these years, uh, and uh, found that neither one of these books did mention Mises' name. Um, by contrast, however, and I think you might find this uh, interesting, um, my parents were refugees from East Germany and for many years we made uh, regular annual trips to visit relatives in East Germany and as a requirement of uh, visiting the workers and peasants paradise as my <laughs> parents and relatives refer to East Germany um, you were required to exchange and spend a certain minimum sum per day and person in East Germany however except for records, um, mostly Russian composers, <coughs> and for books, mostly left-wing literature such as Bertolt Brecht, uh, or some socialist Marxist classics, there existed hardly anything worth buying. <laughs> and I bought plenty of books and still have on my bookshelves today quite a collection of Marx and the other greats of socialism um, and interestingly among the books that I bought is one titled Bourgeois Economics Without Perspective it was published in the mid 1970s by the East German Academy of Science and it was used in universities throughout East Germany at that time uh, and in this book and in distinct contrast to the mainstream text used in West Germany at that time 
there are almost 10 pages devoted to Mises. Um, and in fact, he is quoted directly several times and his famous argument about the impossibility of economic calculation under socialism is correctly summarized. So, uh, in East Germany, you could learn more about Mises uh, than you could in the West at that time. Um, but now, let me return to my story about the discovery of human action. By the early 1970s, I had uh, freed myself from my earlier leftist beliefs and begun to move increasingly to the right. And uh, first I read Friedman and then I read Hayek and became increasingly interested in economics and in particular in the philosophical foundations of economics. Um, however, as much uh, enlightened as I felt by Friedman and Hayek, as someone who had spent most of his time up until then studying philosophy, I was ultimately deeply and fundamentally dissatisfied with both Friedman and Hayek, uh, because on the one hand I immediately recognized that their defense of the market and of free market economics was inconsistent and contradictory. On the one hand, they defended the market and private property, and yet in the same breath they also found all sorts of mistakes and errors and deficiencies with these institutions. Uh, in addition, uh, as far as their views on the philosophy of positive economics was concerned, <coughs> I was equally disappointed and unconvinced. Both Friedman and Hayek championed some variant of the falsificationist or positivist philosophy of science that was propagated by uh, Karl Popper. Um, Mises in Human Action quotes Albert Einstein as saying, and I quote, as far as the theorems of mathematics refer to reality, they are not certain. And as far as they are certain, they do not refer to reality. And this statement only in a slightly more generalized version is essentially also Popper's view. Uh, his view would be as far as any proposition refers to reality, uh, it cannot be certain. And as far as it is certain, it does not refer to reality. Um, this also was by and large the view that uh, Hayek and, uh, and Friedman held. But what I wondered myself about a proposition like the quantity theory of money, for instance. If you increase the supply of money, other things being equal, the purchasing power of money will fall. Now, it seemed to me that this was a statement that was a statement about reality, uh, about real things, about money and purchasing power and so forth, and yet it was a statement that was certainly true and not open to refutation by experience. Um, so I had convinced myself that Friedman and Hayek and by implication also Popper uh, were absolutely wrong at least as far as economics was concerned and I had begun to reconstruct various economic theorems as non-hypothetically true uh, statements about something real. Um, except that I couldn't find anyone else who shared this view, which left me somewhat uncomfortable. Um, but then in, in reading Hayek, I had to come, come across that name again, Mises, and become aware that he too had written on the very question that, uh, that had bothered me for years. And this is how I finally at long last took up Mises. And the first book of his that I concluded I had to take a look at was human action. And what a revelation that was. It took me just a few days to read the whole thing, and from then on I was a changed man. Uh, not only did Mises endorse the same position with regard to economic propositions of which I had already convinced myself that they are apodictically or a prioristically true as Mises himself expressed it, um, and yet that they are also empirical statements that are saying something about real things, um, but far more 
in human action, Mises had already done what I had considered to be sheer impossible, that is to re reconstruct all of economics along these lines and erect a mighty and indeed also a beautifully architectured and systematically integrated uh, intellectual building. Um, he begins with the most simple and yet most fundamental building block, which is individual human action, considered in isolation from everything else. Man acts and he pursues valued goals with scarce means through time. And this, he shows, is not only true and true about something real, it is also undeniably and hence apodictically true because anyone who wanted to deny or disprove this statement that humans act uh, would of course himself uh, be engaging in pursuing goals with ends with, uh, with means and would be acting um, and then from this elementary basis Mises then reconstructs all the laws that hold even if we were to assume that there were only a single individual alive uh, these are the laws of that he refers to as the laws of action in the world. There are two of those laws, the law of marginal utility on the one hand, and the law of return. And then step by step he complicates and enriches the situation. That is, the conditions under which human action takes place. More than one individual, that is, human society exists. And thus, next he takes, takes up the laws of exchange. Uh, and distinguishes between two forms of exchange, voluntary and coercive exchange. Initially he restricts his analysis first to that of voluntary or market exchange, and here in the first step the laws of indirect exchange of consumer goods against other consumer goods or producer goods are reconstructed, and then under the assumption of uncertainty <coughs> he proceeds from direct to indirect exchanges that is the development of money as a special good, uh, a medium of exchange, and of the monetary exchange economy, and then with money in existence, action becomes calculating action, and he reconstructs the law of calculative action, of entrepreneurship, competition, profit, loss, and then the laws of money prices and costs are developed, followed by the laws of money and money substitutes, Next, the theory of interest capital and capital accounting are reconstructed. And finally, he turns to an analysis of compulsory exchanges, the interference with the market economy and its operation. First, he turns his eyes to socialism, characterized as it is by the absence of monetary calculation. And then he analyzes the economic laws of taxation, production restrictions, price controls, currency, credit, and interest rate manipulations. Now, let me leave it at this rather superficial account of the entire book, except to repeat that we have in front of us with human action is something that is simply mind-boggling as an achievement, uh, certainly one of the greatest scholarly books ever written. What I wish to do in the remaining uh, time, however, is uh, rather than looking at the great picture, to pick out a few special marvels from the book which might be easily overlooked or at least underappreciated upon reading it for the very first time but which are nonetheless indicative of the unique greatness of the book and its author. Um, what I will present are uh, some tidbits, brief arguments and insights that are interspersed in this massive treaties and I will take them up in some unsystematic order and uh, my selection is obviously uh, informed by personal idiosyncrasies and uh, likes and dislikes. Uh, let me just first give you a passage, quote you a passage um, for Mises uh, uh, makes a remark about man and man and God um, that uh, reveals somehow his, his philosophical mind at work where he tries to explain something about human action by contrasting human action with our image that we have of God um, there Mises writes this uh, 
scholastic philosophers and theologians and likewise theists and deists of the age of reason conceived an absolute and perfect being, unchangeable, omnipotent, and omniscient, and yet planning and acting, aiming at ends and employing means for the attainment of these ends. But action can only be imputed to a discontented being, and repeated action only to a being who lacks the power to remove his uneasiness once and for all at one stroke. An acting being is discontented and therefore not almighty. If he were contented, he would not act. And if he were almighty, he would have long since radically removed his discontent. For an all-powerful being, there is no pressure to choose between various states of uneasiness. He is not only he is not under the necessity of acquiescing in the lesser evil. Omnipotence would mean the power to achieve everything and to enjoy full satisfaction without being restrained by any limitations. But this is incompatible with the very concept of action. For an almighty being, the categories of ends and means do not exist. He is above all human it is he is above all human comprehension, <coughs> concepts and understanding. For the almighty being, every means renders unlimited services. He can apply every means for the attainment of any ends. He can achieve every end without the employment of any means. It is beyond the faculties of the human mind to think the concept of almightiness consistently to its ultimate logical consequences. The paradoxes are insoluble. Has the almighty being the power to achieve something which is immune to his later interference? If he has this power, then there are limits to his might, and he is no longer almighty. If he lacks this power, he is by virtue of this fact alone not almighty. Are omnipotence and omniscience compatible? Omniscience presupposes that all future happenings are already unalterably determined. If there is omniscience, omnipotence is inconceivable. Impotence to change anything in the predetermined course of events would restrict the power of any agent. So this as an indication of uh, how much he is interested in philosophical puzzles. Um, now I want to turn to another subject that is the subject of time and the economization of time. So very interesting insights that he has to relate regarding this problem. Uh, in a section uh, called The Economization of Time, Mises writes, the economization of time has a peculiar character because of the uniqueness and irreversibility of the temporal order. <coughs> the economization of time is independent of the economization of economic goods and services. Even in the land of cocaine, and I will have to say something about the land of cocaine in a second, even in the land of cocaine, man would be forced to economize time provided he were not immortal and not endowed with eternal youth and indestructible health and vigor. Although all his appetites could be satisfied immediately without any expenditure of labor, he would have to arrange his time schedule as there are states of satisfaction which are incompatible and cannot be consummated at the same time. For this man too, time would be scarce and subject to the aspect of sooner and later. Now, as I said, I want to say a word about uh, the land of cocaine. The land of cocaine, according to the dictionary, is an imaginary country prominent in medieval lore 
where life is a round of luxurious idleness. There are rivers of wine, houses built of cake and barley sugar, and streets are paved with pastry, and the shops gratuitously give goods to everyone. Roast geese and fowls wander about, inviting people to eat them, and buttered larks fall from the sky like manna. <laughs> now, Murray Rothbard told me at some time, uh, after the appearance of human action, that Mises was repeatedly told that American readers typically would not know and never had heard of the land of cocaine. Uh, and that was in 1949, when the world was still decently in order, so to speak. Um, and that they made a suggestion he should simply substitute the Garden of Eden uh, for the land of cocaine. Um, but Mises was a stubborn man, and he never changed it from any edition to the next one. He always kept, uh, kept the land of cocaine in his books. Um, now, uh, some other remarks relating to time and what Mises calls time preference. Um, Mises, along with his uh, teacher, Böhm Barger, and, and the American economist, Frank Fetter, is a proponent of what is called the so-called uh, time preference theory of interest. In short, the theory states that present goods or present satisfaction uh, are always preferred over future goods or future satisfactions of the same kind, and that the phenomenon of interest reflects this value premium of present over future goods, or if you look at it from the other way, uh, the value discount of uh, future goods as compared with present goods. Now, how does Mises explain this phenomenon of time preference and what affects the originary rate of, of interest that is the degree of time preference? Just two, two quotes uh, on, on this issue. First, he says, time preference is a categorical requisite of human action. No mode of action can be thought of in which satisfaction within a nearer period of the future is not, other things being equal, preferred to that in a later period. The very act of gratifying a desire implies that gratification at the present instant is preferred to that at a later instant. If he were not to prefer satisfaction in a nearer period of the future to that in a remoter period, he would never consume and so satisfy his wants. He would always accumulate. He would never consume and enjoy. He would not consume today, but he would not consume tomorrow either, as a moral would confront him with the very same alternative. And on interest, he writes, originary interest is operative in any valuation of external things and can never disappear. If one day a state of affairs were to return, which was actual at the close of the first millennium of the Christian era, when people believed that the ultimate end of all earthly things was impending, men would stop providing for future secular wants. The factors of production would in their eyes become useless and worthless. The discount of future goods as against present goods would not vanish. It would, on the contrary, increase beyond all measure is to say, interest rate would skyrocket. On the other hand, the fading away of originary interest would mean that people do not care at all for one satisfaction in nearer periods of the future. It would mean that they prefer to an apple available today, tomorrow, in one year, or in ten years, two apples available in a thousand or ten thousand years. The disappearance of originary interest would be tantamount to the disappearance of consumption. 
the increase of originary interest beyond all measure would be tantamount to the disappearance of saving and any provision for the future. Now, there's so much about the powers of Alan Greenspan to fix and lower interest <laughs> rates or to manipulate them, as we see, uh, these, these are phenomena uh, that are eternal and unchangeable, nothing, no mortal person can ever do anything about it. Certainly not Alan Greenspan. <laughs> um, what he can do, however, is <coughs> cause financial uncertainty and by causing financial uncertainty, he actually contributes to lowering the savings and increasing interest rates. Another topic of uh, great personal interest to me is uh, what Mises has to say on insurance and insurability. Um, in a chapter of human action on the subject of uncertainty, which does not exist in, in the book's German predecessor, that is in Nationalökonomie, in which Mises uh, most likely added under the influence of his brother Richard von Mises, who was a world famous mathematician and probability theorist who uh, late in his life taught at Harvard. Um, Mises gives a new and ingenious definition of randomness. Uh, which provides at the same time also a definition of the conditions which must be fulfilled if it should be possible that insurance against certain events can be taken out. Now, Mises refers to this condition that must be fulfilled in order to be able to insure oneself against something. He calls this condition class probability, and he gives the following <coughs> definition. Class probability means we know or assume to know with regard to the problem concerned everything about the behavior of a whole class of events or phenomena, but about the actual singular events or phenomena we know nothing but that they are elements of this class. For instance, he writes, we have a complete table of mortality for a definite period of the past in a definite area. If we assume that with regard to mortality no changes will occur, we may say that we know everything about the mortality of the whole population in question. But with regard to the life expectancy of the individual, we do not know anything but that they are members of this class of people. And then he adds that this definition of probability is the only logically satisfactory one. It avoids the crude circularity implied in all definitions referring to the equiprobability of possible events in stating that we know nothing about actual singular events except that they are elements of a class, the behavior of which is fully known, this vicious circle is disposed of. Moreover, it is superfluous to add a further condition called the absence of any regularity in the sequence of the singular events. Uh -huh. And then he notes with respect to insurance. The characteristic mark of insurance is that it deals with the whole class of events. As we pretend to know everything about the behavior of the whole class, there seems to be no specific risk involved in the conduct of business. Now, unfortunately, in human action, Mises does not spell out in great detail the implication of this fundamental insight uh, regarding the conditions and limits of insurability, but he did spell out these implications in his earlier great work on socialism. Um, and let me only say this before I give you a quote from this earlier work. Now, it is obviously implied in Mises' definition of class probability 
um, that those events or phenomena cannot be insured against, um, uh, or, or events cannot be insured against if we do know about any singular event um, more than that it is a member of a class of events about which we know everything. And this is precisely the case whenever we know, for instance, that an event is the outcome of an individual action or is under the control fully or partially of an individual actor. Now, you will immediately see what I'm uh, driving at. Give me a more, few more minutes here. Um, now, let me give you the quote from, uh, from socialism that will make clear what I have in mind. Uh, in socialism, he writes, the value of health and accident insurance becomes problematic by reason of the possibility that the insured person may himself bring about, or at least intensify, the condition insured against. But in the case of unemployment insurance, the condition insured against can never develop unless the insured person so will. Unemployment is a problem of wages, not of work. It is just as impossible to insure against unemployment as it would be to insure against, say, the unsaleability of commodities. Unemployment insurance is definitely a misnomer. There can never be any statistical foundation for such an insurance. Now, I do not have to dwell much longer on the impossibility of unemployment insurance, but a brief comment on the impossibility of health insurance that is implied in this remark is probably in order. Um, because health risks are by and large, or in an increasing number, uh, marginally or fully controllable by individual actions. And because of that, any pooling of health risks is essentially impossible. Uh, during the debate over Clinton's health care reform plan a few years ago, um, there were also several alternative health insurance plans proposed by various so-called free market think tanks, and not one of these alleged free market reform proposals, except the one that the Mises Institute proposed, uh, not one of them seemed to have been uh, even faintly aware of Mises' fundamental insight that any risk pooling is completely out of the question if it is the case that a risk in question can be individually affected and that this is in fact largely and increasingly so uh, the case with respect to health risks. Uh, just as a little uh, tidbit here, uh, can you insure yourself against the, the, uh, the risk of uh, contracting AIDS? The answer is of course you cannot insure yourself against this. You have almost complete control over whether you will get it or you won't get it. Um, a certain lifestyle makes it essentially impossible that you will ever contract it. So risks such as these are not insurable risks. Those are just welfare policies that are enacted and have nothing whatsoever to do with insurance. Um, now related to this, um, is Mises' principle stand against any form of guaranteed minimum income. Um, poverty uh, is also an uninsurable risk, and granting tax support to the poor then is always and necessarily counterproductive and will only produce more poverty. Hardware, for instance, endorsed the idea of a guaranteed minimum income. And so does Friedman. Indeed, Friedman, with his proposal of a negative income tax, wants to organize the welfare state more efficiently, uh, obviously unaware of uh, Rothbard's Rose, fundamental insight that one wants efficiency only with regards to the production of goods, but not with the production of bads. <laughs> and that efficient welfare implies simply more welfare. Um, no, none of that you will find in Mises. 
Mises is consistent and uncompromising. Thus, in human action, he writes with respect to the idea of a guaranteed minimum income, no civilized community has callously allowed the incapacitated to perish. But the substitution of a legally enforceable claim to support or sustenance for charitable relief does not seem to agree with human nature as it is. Not metaphysical prepossessions, but consideration of practical expedi expediency make it inadvisable to promulgate an actionable right to sustenance. So there is no compromising whatsoever. Uh, this brings me to the last topic that I want to touch upon, that is Mises' rationalism and his drive for logical consistency which has earned him a reputation as an extremist or a dogmatist in many circles. Now let me quote from human action what Mises himself has to say in reply to these types of attacks. There he says, some authors try to justify the contradictions of generally accepted ideologies by pointing out the alleged advantages of, comp of a compromise, however, however unsatisfactory from a logical point of view, for the smooth functioning of interhuman relations. They refer to the popular fallacy that life and reality are not logical. They contend that a contradictory system may prove its expediency or even its truth by working satisfactorily while a logically consistent system would result in disaster. There is no need to refute anew such popular errors, he states. Logical thinking and real life are not two separate orbits. Logic is for men the only means to master the problems of reality. What is contradictory in theory is no less contradictory in reality. <clears throat> no ideological inconsistency can provide a satisfactory, that is, working solution for the problems offered by the facts of the world. The only effect of contradictory ideologies is to conceal the real problems and thus prevent people from finding in time an appropriate policy for solving them. Inconsistent ideologies may sometimes postpone the emergence of a manifest conflict, but they certainly aggravate the evils which they mask and render a final solution more difficult. They multiply the agonies, they intensify the hatreds, and make peaceful settlement impossible. It is a serious blunder to consider ideological contradictions harmless or even beneficial. There is no other means of preventing social disintegration and of safeguarding the steady improvement of human conditions than those provided by reason. Man must try to think through all the problems involved up to the point beyond which a human mind cannot proceed farther. And neither then, in his, in his insistence on reason and on rational insight as a foundation of human societies is also poles apart from his famous student Hayek. Let me briefly illustrate this by giving you a characteristic quote from Hayek and then contrasting it to what Mises has to say. Uh, Hayek says things like this. We have never designed our economic system we were not intelligent enough for that. We have tumbled into it. Civilization resulted not from human design or intention, but spontaneously. Moral traditions outstrip the capacities of reason. Mind is not a guide, but a product of natural evolution. This is what Hayek has to say. Now listen what Mises has to say on these topics. Jesus says, man was once a brutal beast, 
but one must not forget that he was a physical weak animal. He would not have been a match for the big beasts of prey if he had not been equipped with a peculiar weapon, reason. The fact that man is a reasonable being, that he therefore does not yield without inhibitions to every impulse, but arranges his conduct by a too reasonable deliberation, must not be called unnatural from a zoological point of view. Rational conduct means that man, in the face of the fact that he cannot satisfy all his impulses, desires and appetites, foregoes the satisfaction of those which he considers less urgent in order not to endanger the warping of social cooperation, man is forced to abstain from satisfying those desires whose satisfaction would hinder establishment of societal institutions. There is no doubt that such a renunciation is painful. However, man has made his choice. He has renounced the satisfaction of some desires incompatible with social life and has given priority to the satisfaction of those desires which can be realized only or in a more plentiful way under a system of the division of labor. He has entered upon the way toward civilization, social cooperation and wealth. This decision is not irre irrevocable and final. The choice of the fathers does not impair the son's freedom to choose. <coughs> they can reverse this resolution. Every day they can proceed to the transvaluation of values and prefer barbarism to civilization or, as some authors say, the soul to the intellect, mis to reason and violence to peace. But they must choose. It is impossible to have things incompatible with each other. So in Mises' case, is we choose reason to employ our reason. We are never stumbling into something. More specifically, Mises notes like Etienne de de la Boétie before him and also David Hume that in particular government power even that of the most despotic government rests ultimately on ideas and ideologies false as they might be but rests on ideas and accordingly their power can also be broken and rendered ineffective by other ideas by changed and correct ideas. In this respect he writes, of course it is possible to establish government upon the violent oppression of reluctant people. It is a characteristic mark of state and government that they apply violent coercion or the threat of it against those not prepared to yield voluntarily. Yet such violent oppression is no less founded upon ideological might. He who wants to apply violence needs the voluntary cooperation of some people. An individual entirely dependent on himself can never rule by means of physical violence only. He needs the ideological support of a group in order to subdue other groups. The tyrant must have a retinue of partisans who obey his orders out of their own accord. The sp their spontaneous obedience provides him with the apparatus he needs for the conquest of other people. Whether or not he succeeds in making his sway last depends on the numerical relation of the two groups. Those who support him voluntarily and those whom he beats into submission. Though a tyrant may temporarily rule through, through a minority if this minority is armed and the majority is not, in the long run a minority cannot keep the majority in subservience. The oppressed will rise in rebellion 
and cast off the yoke of tyranny. Changes in public opinion can bring down even the most powerful governments. Now lastly and in conclusion, I cannot do better than quote from the last two paragraphs of human action. There Mises says, Men's freedom to choose and to act is restricted in a threefold way. There are first the physical laws to, to whose unfeeling absoluteness men must adjust his conduct if he wants to live. There are second the individual's innate constitutional characteristics and dispositions and the operation of environmental factors. Um, we know that they influence both the choice of the ends and that of the means, although our cognizance of the mode of their operation is rather vague. And there is finally the regularity of phenomena with regard to the interconnectedness of means and ends. That is, the praxeological law as distinct from the physical and physiological law. The elucidation of the categorical and formal examination of this third class of laws of the universe is a subject matter of praxeology and its hitherto best developed branch economics. The body of economic knowledge is an essential element in the structure of human civilization. It is a foundation upon which modern industrialism and all the moral, intellectual, and disregard its teachings and warnings, they will not annul economics, they will stamp out society and the human race. Now it is human action above all, and those who will continue to read and study human action, uh, which I hope will stand in the way that this uh, prediction will ever come through. Thank you very much.